Hi, everybody. Let's see. Hello. Hi, Jeannie. Hi, Taria, Laura, Benedict, Dwight, Marina, Jacqueline. Nice to see you all. Well, I can't see you, but you can see me. Um, so let's see, are we on time? It's 1 p.m. Did everybody get a chance to head on over to the website? And if you didn't, this is what today's page should look like for you. We have uh, some videos on Diego Velasquez. And in this part, I was able to go through some of the paintings and there's actually a little blurb about many of the paintings that you may find interesting. I didn't have a chance to um, you know, write all of this out in the PowerPoint, but this, uh, if you liked any of the paintings, you can read a little bit more here than what I'm gonna get into today. Um, so these are some of Velasquez's, Velasquez's most famous paintings. And then we have Fairfield Porter. So Fairfield Porter, look, Fairfield Porter is the more contemporary living artist. He is deceased, he is not alive, um, but uh, still very relevant for the time and worth talking about today in comparison to Diego Rivera. So just very quickly, um, one thing that you should really know about um, Fairfield Porter is that he was also an art critic. He spent a lot of time writing about art and if you get a chance to read this book, Art on Its Own Terms, I highly recommend it. Um, and then there's a few videos about him. It wasn't as easy to find uh, videos on him. So there's not too many videos, but there is a few. His websites and um, articles and I am focusing more today on the figurative work but if you do like his work I highly recommend you take a look at his landscapes especially my landscape crew um, because they're they remind me a little bit of um, well he was very influenced by Vuillard and Bonard who you know I talk about all the time as well as Diego Velasquez um, but his landscapes are really pleasant, and they remind me a little bit of Mirandi, a woman named Camilla Talbot, um, and what's her name? I can't think of it right now, but I'll think of it and tell you. Okay, so let's head over to the, let's get this out of the way. I don't know how to get rid of this. Here, let me get rid of this zoom here. Expand my... PowerPoint and we'll take a look at some art. So you got the handout from me yesterday, so hopefully everyone had a chance to read it. If you did not, we're gonna go over a few points right now anyway. Uh, so the, um, I guess I did it backwards this time. Fairfield Porter uh, is the, the younger artist or the, the more contemporary living artist. He was born June 10th, 1907 in Winnetka, Illinois. And he died in Southampton, New York. He was an American painter, printmaker, and art critic. Um, he um, was a figurative painter, and he spent a lot of time painting out uh, during the summers. Um, let's see. He uh, da -da, informed Porter, was, whose father was an architect. He grew up with art. He studied art history at Harvard. He then joined the Art Students League, which was a really important, vibrant group at the time. Um, and if any of you know anything about that group, I'd love to hear more about it. They were quite a, a wild group of, of artists uh, working under Thomas Hart Benton. And then he ended up traveling abroad for several years and then returned to Illinois. And then eventually he spent um, the rest of his life in New York, where he write, wrote art criticism and painted um, he, like I said, he loved Wiard, he loved Bonard, and he loved uh, Diego Velasquez. He was also very good friends with a lot of the abstract expressionist painters, and they're known for their really bold color. So people like Wilhelm de Kooning had a big influence on the way um, that he used paint in his paintings. Uh, 
Then we have Diego Velasquez, who was, oh, that's so interesting. I didn't realize that one was born June 6th and one was born June 10th. I didn't put that together, but born um, only 500 years apart, 400 years apart, 400 years apart and four days apart. Uh, and he was born, this is one of our Spanish painters of the 1600s, so we're going way back um, to Diego Velasquez, the great and at the age of 11, he began his apprenticeship under Francisco Pacheco. He ended up um, surpassing him within, um, I, don't, I can't remember. Well, by the time he was 30, he had completely surpassed him in painting and he ended up marrying his daughter. And Mr. Pacheco had a lot of connections and enrolled him to go paint uh, King Philip. And then he was invited um, after that, to, oh no, sorry, to paint the Duke and then the King. And then um, he became more well known by the court and he was invited finally by the King to come live in the court, um, which is what he did. And he was one of the uh, court painters for 30 something years that he did that. And you know, he moved up in rank and he was one of the King's favorite painters. And he was entrusted to paint things that other people were not allowed to paint. Uh, for example, he had such a good relationship with the family that he was commissioned to paint the dwarves of the court. Now, if you know anything about uh, history, which I'm sure you all have some breadth of history, that what happened in those days is there was a lot of inbreeding and uh, because they wanted to keep the royal lineage. But what happens when you inbreed is that you get children that are not, um, that have a lot of disabilities. So they had a lot of dwarves in the court and he was um, given the uh, job of painting the dwarves and the family. Um, and his most famous painting, which we're gonna go over is called Las Meninas and it is a painting of the family. Um, he traveled to Italy and was very influenced by Caravaggio and um, the Italian painters there, which very much influenced his work. And we can think of people like Titian were painting at that time and Tintoretto and uh, I don't know, lots of other great painters. Um, and he was friends with Peter Paul Rubens. Um, it, I, we should definitely do a class on Rubens. He's an amazing painter as well. Um, but Velasquez was very, had a great, interesting life. He got to live as a successful artist his entire life. Um, and he lived in the court and he painted and he was given, he moved up in, in his uh, role in the, in the palace and eventually designed, he even designed clothes and rooms and he did all kinds of things with the court because his taste was so trusted and his paintings were so incredible. Um, it's even thought that the, the king would come, he painted the king many times and the king's family, but um, he would come and just sit and watch him paint a lot of the time in, in, the, in, the, in his studio because he was so enthralled by Velasquez's work and we were going to take a look at why right now. So this is the most famous painting of Diego Velasquez. And it is called Las Meninas. It is one of the later paintings of, one of the last paintings that he painted for the court. Now, similarly to, uh, reminds me a bit of the Corbet painting that we looked at over the summer. Large painting of him in his salon with his studio and his large canvas of a landscape, but there's all these people around. So this is a painting of, uh, you can see, this is Diego Velasquez himself, and he has painted himself a self-portrait in the painting with his canvas in the painting. And then we have the princess right here um, and her maid um, or maidens or courtesans, uh, excuse me if I'm not getting this completely right. But, um, and then these are a couple of the dwarves of the family, the family dog, and then we have the nurse, and back here we have another um, man, and I can't rem remember who this guy is in the black back here. And then if you look around the room, there are several paintings, and the paintings have, uh, they're chosen very much by him, paintings of other paintings within the painting. 
while uh, he is painting a painting of a painting in a painting. That's crazy. Um, and then we have, if you look back here, in, there's a mirror which is reflecting, and I guess this is up for debate, but to me it's really not. It's very clear that it's the king and queen. So technically what we're looking at here is if the king and queen were standing where we are as the viewer, they would be the ones reflected in that mirror, correct? So therefore that puts us essentially in the same shoes as the royals, as the king and queen looking in on this scene of um, the princess being painted and, and this one of the final masterpieces considered of painting in the entire world is this painting, is one of the most paintings that has ever happened in the entire world. And you can just look at it and see why. Of course, um, if you get a chance to see it in person, you absolutely should. I think it lives in Mer Madrid. Um, I haven't seen it myself. I would love to. I've been looking at it in history books forever, and I know those moments when you actually get to go see the paintings in real life. It's just one of a kind feeling. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things going on. There's groups of threes, there's groups of twos, there's different horizon lines, but essentially what we're looking at is a grouping of the royal family with their, uh, their court and the artist himself painting himself into the painting. So I did a few of these um, individual paintings of the artists as well, where I thought that they needed to be um, seen in, in one because all this stuff gets in the way when I'm trying to talk and you can't see the images. It drives me crazy like this. But I'm gonna move this one over here because this is really just a cropped image of the same painting of the Velasquez. But the point that I was trying to get at as is in my comparison is that they're both painting themselves as the artists with the canvas, with their uh, easel. Um, now, Fairfield Porter was also painting, he was painting family members, he was not painting the court, he was living in New York in the 50s. He was painting in the summer, he was painting his family, and to me, it really looks like he's painting the American dream. And so these paintings have this quality of summer and light and happiness and calm at the same time. But they're just lovely, delicious paintings with a, a brush mark that has, it's not overdone, it's not overthought. He, he puts these things together sort of like puzzle pieces almost. And you can see his color palette is very different than Velasquez. And he's not trying to make a photorealistic painting of himself. He's trying to make the idea of a painting of himself. And he's, um, you know, he, at this time, you can think he's hanging out with a lot of abstract expressionists who, who are influencing, influencing him greatly, even though he continues to paint as a representational artist. A representational artist is someone who paints what they see, a rep, what they, they're representing something rather than non-objective, which is abstract, meaning there's nothing there that you could pick out. But here we can pick out a man standing in his studio in both of these paintings. We have their man standing in the studio with, look at this, there's uh, his chosen paintings back here, and we also have um, Porter's chosen paintings in the back wall over here. They both also have open windows. This one's cropped a little bit because I cut the picture. But they also have open windows with the light coming across from the left to the right. Um, these are things, that's something I just decided to say and notice right now. Sometimes when I see these comparisons, that's the fun thing to find. That, you know, I think I'm making a comparison and then I find all of these other comparisons along the way. And I really, you know, I could have, you can compare anyone and find a common theme. Well, not always, but, um, you know, I, I could have done a million different comparisons, but I thought these, these two paintings in particular were um, especially interesting. Even the shadows are similar underneath them. Even the time of day is slightly similar, it seems to me. It's just that uh, in Velasquez, he's in a much bigger room with less windows and a lot more space. So it looks like a lot darker. Okay, next painting. Here we have on the left, this painting is the Triumph of Bacchus. And it is um, 
the Greek god of wine who is doling out the wine to the drunk skies here. And I don't know all the ins and outs of this painting, but what I really want you to understand about these paintings is the absolute sheer greatness of the application of paint. I mean, look at this. There's places where these paintings look painterly, they look abstract, and then there's places where they're really tight and you can see the light in every fold on the god. But then look at how he's dealt with the other people in a different way. He's dealt with the, these guys with the red faces. They're a lot looser. They're not painted nearly as tight as the gods. It's almost like two different people painted them, but that's how he gets you to pay more attention to where he wants your eye to travel. The light, look at the light he chose here. He even, the figure in the very front is the darkest figure in the room, in the space, they're outdoors. Um, so you can think about his, his composition, you can think about his subject matter, and you can think about more than anything, I believe that he is considered a master based on the way that he, he captured the likeness of the person, not just by the way they look, but by the way that they were. And um, I just think these paintings are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, look at this. I'm, you know, I'm always telling you guys in life drawing class, hey, get the vase, get the, get the blue vase in there. And here's the vase, here's the bowl, here's the material underneath them. All of these things come into play. If you can see that this figure carries us into the painting, even this bit of light right here, this light green, as Americans, we read, well, I know a lot of you are not American, but in, I read left to right, and therefore it's important um, to think any, most, you know, uh, I shouldn't say that, I because look at, even though it doesn't matter, you could come in the right side too, and he's given us a pathway in, and he's given us a pathway out, and he's given us a way to travel through the space, even these branches up here, they lead us to the glass of wine that he's holding, the chalice. So absolutely fascinating paintings that I could keep talking about, but I'm gonna run out of time if I don't stop. And then over here we have some of um, uh, Porter's painting of a, I don't know if it's a family member, but it is a woman and a child. And what I think is so great about his paintings is the simplicity while still capturing the absolute essence of what's going on. Uh, the background, the color in the, the sky is almost just this plain gray light blue and then there's this bit of pink coming in back here which leads us right into her and the bits of pink that are on her dress and her skin tone and his skin tone or I don't know if it's a boy or a girl but there's um his palette and his color choice it's almost, it's got a lot of pastels, but then it has these bold moments as well, like the, the red jumpsuit that he's wearing and the brown hair that she has. Um, and they're a little bit flat, but they also bend and turn, but it's almost like he wanted to put a, down as few marks as he could while still representing the subject. In turn, Velasquez, put down as many marks as he needed to put down to make it look as real as possible. But at the same time, you get to notice when we get to things like um, the material of the figure on the figure, I'm just gonna shrink myself for a minute, it's driving me crazy, um, that uh, the material and the lace, especially the lace, when you see things like this lace moment right here on the dwarf. Um, it looks like lace from far away, and when you get close, it's very much, much a loose brushwork. Um, try to get myself back here. All right, so this is, uh, both of these are very weird paintings, if you ask me. But this is the dwarf, one of the port dwarves on the left here. And Velasquez was given the task of making them look um, honor, honorable. Um, 
And I think he did a really good job. I think he, you know, they want them, they wanted them to look like them. They didn't want them to make, make something up. But he's also, you know, he looks like he's thinking, he's looking right at you. He's obviously got uh, some deformities to maybe his hands and his body. Uh, nevertheless, he, he looks very honored in this painting. And he's really a deep stare right at the viewer, right at the painter maybe. Maybe he was staring at, the, at Velasquez while he was painting him. Um, and then over here on the right, we have a, a very odd painting of the little girl, his daughter, I believe, and in his studio. And again, we have the mimicking of the painter being reflected in the painting behind the girl. So he's set up a mirror right behind her so that he can get her and then he also has the reflection of her back the back of her chair the window behind her that jug and there's a heater and there's a wall of paintings and then there's the artist and you know it's the artist because he's holding a paintbrush plus there's multiple paintings of him so we know what he looks like um, but I just find that both of these paintings sort of stare right into you and they're kind of eerie um, and also just very interesting and odd paintings. I wish I knew what this yellow lump was. Maybe it's a bag, but very mysterious. Anyway, next one. Um, here's the king, the king that took a uh, great, great love for Diego Velasquez. And um, this is a hunting painting of him with his dog here. And uh, these are very, normal court paintings to have been made during the time. Um, and there's lots of paintings of him. Um, I don't know how many specifically, but there are plenty, plenty, plenty. And maybe you've all seen some of them. I'm sure that we've all, not sure, but I, I, I know that I've seen these, some of these paintings at the Frick and at uh, in the Met and different places like that. But if you've specifically seen some of these paintings, any painting by Velasquez, I would love for you to post that. Um, any that are different from the ones I'm showing today, as well as the same, it's fine. But you can post those in the comment section, along with uh, posting a painting of yourself the artist with your art tools. Maybe it's an easel, maybe it's your paintbrush in your hand, maybe it's a reflection of you in the mirror. So there's a lot of options. I would love to see some self-portraits here. Now the thing that I, uh, the connection I make between these two artists, because there's a lot of artists who paint figures, but these two artists, one, one thing I noticed that is very strange about both of them that is similar is the stance in which they choose to put the models, um, or, or the, the, the model, I'm just gonna say model. Um, I mean, look at this, this is a very strange stance for her to be posing it. And I think it's such a weird choice. It seems like he very much was looking at Velasquez's poses and mimicking art history in his paintings. Now, I've talked about Guillard before and Bonard, did I talk about Vuillard? He's one of my favorites. I mean, I know I've talked about him in life drawing class, and he's sort of the king of yellow, in my opinion, yellows and grays. And so you can see that those colors really affected him and his mood when he saw those paintings in 1938 um, when he was off traveling somewhere. So um, these paintings just stare you down, don't they? All of these ones, the past ones too, look at them, they're just staring you down. Even these, they're, this, this guy's looking you right in the eye. This, she's looking you right in the eye. It's just such a trip. Um, here we have uh, just another home scene from, the, from Porter. And what I, I always think of him as sort of the, the painter of the American dream. You know, these people are out on boats and they're in the field and they're enjoying their day. And then uh, over here we have, um, oh, and the lighting. I love the lighting with the lamp too. And this is very much Weard. I can very much see the influence of Weard in this painting. And then we have another one of the dwarves here and he's looking pretty sweet. I don't quite know what he's holding, but 
again, these paintings are so much more powerful in person because what's fascinating about them is how real they look from a distance and as you get closer, just how much brushwork he lets you see. And that is why he is considered one of the most famous painters of our time, one of the best painters of all time, because he was able to have the paintings look like paint and at the same time look real. Um, here's another, oh, this is uh, Innocent. What's his name? I wrote it down. Innocent X. I don't know. I don't know who he is. Uh, but you can see the velvet. Look at the material. Look at the use of... God, I wish I could get rid of myself. The use of material here. Look at this uh, bit of lace and there's sort of... Um, I don't know what that material is called where it's all lots of little waves. And then the velvet. And this, I mean, this is just a we're looking at an image of an image of an image on my computer. You know, if you could see this in person, you probably would want to reach out and touch that velvet. And as you got closer, you could see that, oh my gosh, it's just a brush stroke. How did he do that? He's just an absolute master of illusion. And then we have this quiet, simple, lovely painting. And I love the light coming across her face right here. Look how he's left that just perfectly white. There's elements of this painting that are perfectly white here, here, here. They almost look, they almost read like a paint by number in a way. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in the, like, look at the section of the light yellows. It's all one piece. And then there's another section of a different yellow. And then there's another section of a different green. And it's almost like, okay, I'm gonna put this color in all these places, and I'm gonna put this color in these places. And it, and it pieces together like a puzzle. This one looks like a watercolor or gouache, which I've been playing with. I don't think I like it, but I don't know. I'm going to keep trying. Um, okay, so here's another, here's a good example of uh, everyday life in the 1600s and with the, uh, the weavers here, the spinners. Spin, what's it called when you're spinning the yarn you're making the yarn the yarn makers i forget what it's called in spanish it's called hilanderas and then over here we have this like picturesque moment of a summer in new york maybe cape may or wherever they spent their vacations long island or something and, and the light is just gorgeous and the blue of the chairs is reflected in the sky what you can see and learn from these two artists is, uh, I squinted, is the, the values. We've been talking about values and landscape. Look at these trees versus the light of the sky versus the green of the ground. I mean, that is value. And he's really got it down to three or four tones in this painting. And similarly, Velasquez does too. He's chosen very carefully where the light hits. Look, it comes through this back window. And he does that often. He did that in the Las Meninas too. There's a door open with the light coming through and then it's pouring onto her and it's telling us where to look. It's helping us know where to see. And that is why tone is so important. And then we have our darks and we know, you know, just how dark this room is that they are in and how much lighter the room behind is. And we're able to travel through these paintings based on the things in the room, the composition, even this, look at this red curtain pulling over, the lattice, ladder, is all, it's bringing us right down to her so we can travel through. Everything connects, everything is important. Everything is in its place, everything is there for a reason. They didn't put all this stuff in the room just for fun. They put it in to help tell the narrative and the composition and to help our eyes travel through the space. Similarly, we have, uh, you know, I think he learned so much about composition and color and tone from Velasquez and Guillard and Bonard, and it's all just read here in his own way of doing it. What time is it? Oh, man, it's already time. Okay, so here's a few more. Uh, landscapes. I just wanted to show a few of his landscapes. Um, they're not comparing to anything, but they're just delicious, lovely, beautiful, simple, quiet moments that feel like a dream of perfection, don't they? 
and we just accept them even though they're big wide loose brush strokes that are sort of plopped together to come together to make this gorgeous thing at the end and it all makes sense look at this i love how he puts this bit of wall right here on the left side of the end of the painting and just how dark that tree is that's close to us and how far away and gray in the distance the rest of it is simple moments so when people tell me there's nothing to paint here i'm like what do you mean look at this there's look at this you can pull the oranges the greens this bit of wall sky sometimes the best paintings are the simplest ones you just have to look a little harder look at this this is the side of a house like no big deal we have water it's, but he's made the composition interesting look at how he's chosen to put these tree branches in here look at the dog coming to the door like you can make anything exciting you just have to decide to do it and use your creativity and pull out more color pull out more composition or pull out more tone and you can emphasize things that way and that's how you make things interesting um, last couple I just wanted to show this pink painting I love the pink coming across the sky of this house it's like hitting the house with these pink clouds and I just think it's fantastic you can look up more of his work and then um, everyday life uh, sorry I'm getting blah blah blah, blah. Uh, this one is Christ in the house of Martha and Mary and they're preparing a very regular meal for the time and then you can see Christ back there with some visitors who come in through the window um, and then this is one of his most famous and only nude um, called Roki Rokebi Venus and she is they think that she was one of his uh, lovers I don't know what the right way to say that is um, one of his ladies so and this painting is literally one of the most beautiful nudes you will ever see in your life if you get the chance to see it please do the end uh, if you want to say anything um, you can unmute yourself at this point and let me know if you have any comments about these artists and um, if you don't have any comments, I'd love for you to go to the website and post a comment if you've seen any of these paintings in real life or make a painting of yourself as the artist, of the artist, in the art, in the painting, making the painting of the painting. Got it? Anybody want to say anything about any of these artists? Somebody asked me for Velasquez, so this was for you whoever it was. He was Marina. No? No one? Okay. Bye, everybody. Oh. Yes? Hello. Hi, it's Ellen. Hi. Yes, I'm sorry to jump in. I, can't, I, I came in late, too, but I just did want to say I have seen Velasquez in person. Oh, good. Spain, and it's amazing. His Where did you see? I don't remember. I, we were all over the place, and I can't remember exactly what museum it was. I think in um, Barcelona, maybe? Mm -hmm. Probably. He lived yeah. in Seville. He lived in Madrid. Um, yeah, we were in Madrid, Barcelona, and Bilbao. And I think it was, oh, God, maybe it was Madrid. I don't know. But um, fabulous, fabulous, amazing work. Amazing paintings. Just absolutely so powerful. powerful. So I think there might even be one in the the Timkin right now. I'm not. I can't remember. I'll have to look it up. Um, yeah. But I'll take a look and see. And maybe there might be some in the San Diego Art Museum too. There might be one or two worth worth looking. I'll ask my friend. She works there. It's it's so not my kind of art. You know, I like contemporary art and stuff like that. But man, when you really look at these paintings and like you were saying, the brushstroke and everything, and how that could just cut. Um, it is abstract when you get close that's what's amazing is they look so realistic and then you get close and you can really just see every brush stroke and you think how did he do that like how did he know where to put it because you can't tell where what it is until you're further away it's just magic it's yeah. magic it's fabulous. <laughs> i love it <laughs> thanks thanks everybody thanks for doing fairfield porter oh you're welcome yeah that too wow is that that Joanne? <laughs> yeah yeah Thank oh yeah you. he's awesome he's a great guy everybody should read uh, art on its own terms well, I remember I had to read that in grad school it was a good book oh the, the, his colors are just oh they're delicious brushes. reminds me a little bit of uh, Wolf Khan some of the combinations yeah. 
colors and yeah. capturing certain it's definitely light that of the day. feeling of a uh, New York summer color. That's how I feel. It's definitely <laughs> a lot of those artists who paint those summer colors. Ruth Miller's another one. Um, they all have this sort of like, it's like so bright for them, maybe because winter's so much darker, I don't know. But it, you can really see how they've seen so much light at that time um, yeah. in those summer kind of feeling paintings. Uh, okay, thanks everyone. Very cool, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Oh gosh, I didn't record it again. Dang it. <laughs> oh yeah, it is recording. It is recording. Yay. Yay.